Hey everybody, we're here today with Alex from NYC, NYC Pain MD, um, and he's the new patient education coordinator, and he does a great job there. He, he's an expert on all, all of their treatments, um, and he's an expert at explaining how these treatments work um, in lay, layman's terms, you know, because sometimes when you talk to a doctor, they're using all these big terms and stuff, and 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 the technology they're, that, that they're using today is so, so incredible that um, it, it, it can kind of go over your head. So um, today we're going to talk about um, knee, hip, and shul shoulder pain, mostly arthritis stuff. And we're going to talk about some of the most advanced medical treatments that are out there today. Um, and we're also going to talk about stem cell. Um, it, it's a real buzzword now. And, um, you know, you know, I... I, for one, know when, when I go to my Facebook, I see a lot of ads and I, and I see a lot of claims and, and I see some stuff that, you know, stem cell can cure everything. And we're going to talk about that. We're, we're going to get to the real, the real truth because uh, stem, stem cell is powerful stuff, but it's, it's, it's not this ma magical um, cure-all that, that you're probably see, seeing these ads for, too. So... Um, I'm going to introduce him. His name is Alex. And Alex, do you want to say a little bit about a little bit about you and uh, exactly what you do at NYC Pain MD? Yeah. Hey, uh, Brad. Thank you for having us. And um, so I've been around the medical world for quite a while. I've managed offices, and uh, I took on the uh, the role of a patient education and communicator and scheduling uh, coordinator, so to speak. So I've been around this world of a non-surgical orthopedic, you know, interventional management of pain for joints, knees, back, shoulders, hips. So I've gotten very familiar with it. Uh, I think patients do enjoy what you mentioned, a more layman's approach, because doctors can be very confusing sometimes. And it's easier to kind of get right to the point if you can talk person to person on someone's level that they can understand and uh, embrace and make better choices about their own health. Okay, that's that's great here. So what we're going to talk about first is um, we're going to talk about <clears throat> gel injections. We you know we hear a lot about this um, in lay layman's terms. It's called it's called that, but it's it's really visco supplementation. That's um, and you and you guys are, are doing that, right? Um, could you could you explain what what these injections are? What they're good for, um, and what you guys are doing differently there to get to get the results. Right. So that's a, a multi-part answer, but I think if we start from the beginning, in order for uh, patients and and listeners to understand uh, the use of these quote-unquote gel injections, is you know what are the conditions that it's treating? Uh, but but basically, as people age. Uh, the way you get arthritis is the natural lubricant called synovial fluid. That's a slightly fancy term, which is pretty tantamount to uh, or analogous to oil in your car. Well, these special cells start to get old and they fail and they stop producing this natural lubricant. This, of course, creates friction within the joint and it can happen in any joint, your knee, your shoulder, your hip. And as this friction builds up, it begins to wear out the shiny cartilage surface on the top of your bones. Now, that cartilage it's kind of like Teflon on a fry pan. And when that peels off, everything starts to stick. This friction begins to grind and wear and grind and wear. And slowly, the space in between those joints can become more and more narrow. Uh, most of us have heard that term thrown around bone to bone. But there's a big, a big a gradient of arthritis. You can have level four, which is bone to bone. You can have level one. Obviously, the earlier you get at it, the better. So... Uh, Way, way, way back, I think in the 70s, veterinarians started to inject these lubricants into racehorses. And then it was brought into the human, human trials, and they started using it in Europe in the 80s. And then finally, by late 1990s, it was approved for use in the States. But the idea of gel injections or visco supplementation is to replace what nature isn't producing anymore, like putting oil into a car. Sometimes patients jokingly call it joint oil. And um, so... By applying this joint oil, you replace the natural lubricant, you reduce the friction, you cushion the joint. These lubricants, they actually absorb inflammatory chemicals, uh, they reduce the pain, and hopefully they make the joint last longer and longer while you start to feel better. Now, you also asked about what's important about how we do it and what we do different. Well, keep in mind, as I explained, that when you get arthritis, 
the joint space gets more and more narrow. We now have a very limited space to place that lubricant in. So what research has found that no matter how experienced the doctor might be, that you will miss that joint space completely one out of three times. This creates lots of problems. First of all, the treatment will fail because you won't apply the medicine where you need it. Second of all, uh, it can create a safety factor where you're putting uh, an injectable needle or a needle tip into a tissue that might be damaged permanently. And third of all, it's going to be very uncomfortable if you miss that joint space and go into another sensitive tissue. So our doctors figure out a way to get around this. And we developed a technique called precision arthritis targeting technology. We sometimes use the moniker of PAT, P-A-T-T. So the importance of PAT cannot be understated, but the way we have to do this with a special machine called a fluoroscopic imager. So if you're a candidate for the procedure, all, our doctors will only treat those joints when they need this visco supplementation using these special imaging devices. And Brad, the, the key to this is that not only does the doctor see in live motion, it's a live motion picture of the procedure, they can identify the joint space with this motion image. They can see the injectable tip that goes into your joint in live motion, but that's not where they stop. They then do a procedure called, another fancy word, arthrography. They inject a little bit of milky contrast media so they can secondarily, it's a second confirmation that we're exactly where we need to be. After they do that, they reprep the applicator and they apply or shoot in this natural FDA approved lubricant. And there's many of those on the market. We can talk about that in a bit. And once that lubricant goes in, they'll see on this medical TV camera, the imager, they'll see the, that contrast media be diluted. That's a third confirmation. Essentially, essentially they're going to triple confirm the exact precision to make sure you have the best chance of getting the best possible outcome. So I, I think I overviewed and answered most of your questions. Was there another part to that? No, the, the, that's a lot of great stuff there. Um, it, it's, is there any risk that I've, I've actually read some stuff say, saying that um, um, these treatments sometimes, sometimes they can work and sometimes they don't, they don't work, you know? Um, what, what kind of results are you guys, do, do you guys get? And, um, you know, does it matter what type of, what type of substance you're using to inject and and what about the the imaging you're using there um i actually read a study that stated that that if these injections are done blind that 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 the doctors can miss the joint space i believe it was 30 percent of the time um so so first of all what what about the different um substances and then what about the imaging and missing the joint space. Right. And so, you know, we can address the joint space uh, in, in a minute. So, uh, Brad, there's a, about five or six major uh, medical lubricants on the market. First of all, these are all FDA approved. They are made by major pharmaceutical houses, but the beauty of them is that they're completely natural. These are not pharmaceuticals. This cannot be con con uh, uh, confused with cortisone which has pharmaceutical side effects like raising your blood pressure and your blood sugar. That's why they become uh, somewhat uh, concerning for patients that are diabetic or have very high blood pressure. Uh, but these are FDA approved natural lubricants. Uh, and there's two major types on the market. One famously are taken from the rooster's comb, you know, that floppy red thing on the top of uh, the rooster's head. They are then processed and they are created into a gel-like substance. Uh, the other method is kind of like making yogurt. They are prepared with natural enzymes and made in an agar plate, and they produce a different type of formula or molecule. So just like there's many painkillers on the market, like Advil, Aleve, uh, Tylenol, they all have a different chemical background. And so when a doctor examines you, it's very individualized. Some patients may be uh, oriented towards one type versus the other. Now, we have all these types in our clinic. And when you're evaluated, the doctors will make a choice on which may be best for you. Well, some patients respond well to one and not the other. Sometimes they use them in combination. But you also asked about danger and things like that. So first of all, the patients are always concerned about pain during procedures. What our docs do is they have a special freeze spray, freeze spray type formula. So that kind of gives you a light numbing. 
And then they give you just a little dash of lidocaine. Now, you're familiar with this from when you go to the dentist and your, your gums get totally numbed up. And so once the joint space, whether it be your shoulder, your hip, your knee, your ankle, uh, it's very numb. And then they can do the procedure. And I would say it, it's barely noticeable. Uh, maybe like getting a flu shot, uh, you know, at your primary doctor's office. But generally, the comfort is, is very, very tolerable. The discomfort, I should say. Uh, one of the other things about danger is whenever you're getting a procedure where a doctor is injecting uh, or doing even a minimally invasive procedure, you have to be very careful with infection. So prior to the treatment, the doctors make sure to swab very heavily uh, something along the line of betadine, which kills every bacteria, every bug known to mankind. And every uh, kit or every application is, of course, prepared on the spot. So there's minimal to almost no risk of an infection. We've never had one in our office that I know of, uh, but so that that is a concern. And of course, we make sure to take every step necessary to avoid that. So it's very minimally minimally risky, and the any discomfort is minimal to nothing for most patients. And I think there was another part to your question, but um, yeah, um, what what kind of results um, should someone results, should someone right. expect? You know, you, you you like you know you see a lot of advertisements and stuff, and get, guaranteeing a lot of stuff, a lot of results and stuff. What what what's what's the truth here? Right, that's a great question. And it's one that should always be addressed. In the medical world, Brad, you know that uh, no doctor can guarantee any particular result for any group of patients. Every single person is individual. And that's why we do a special screening evaluation and detailed consultation. Um, everybody has different shape, sizes, and responses to care. Um, that said, um, there is a lot of promises out there. Um, and it's probably inappropriate. If someone's getting a, a guarantee from a doctor, I'd be very careful to work with that doctor. However, what I can say safely is that I would say that the vast majority of patients in our clinic are very happy to ecstatic about their overall results. But if I would give you statistics, I'd say six out of seven patients do very well and reach their goal of pain relief, uh, getting mobility back, getting back on their feet, moving better, maybe not perfect, but better. And some patients respond 95%, some people 40%, some people 20%. And I would say a small percent don't respond at all. Uh, and these are patients that the doctor deemed a reasonable candidate, but there's, there's no group of people where you're gonna get a 100% response rate. More specifically, a great study was done by an orthopedic surgeon uh, out of, I think, Louisiana State and this doctor found that after he went back on about 1,100 patients, don't quote me on that, let's say 1,000, uh, who had come in believing that they were all bone to bone, stage four. They ranged in age from 40s to 80s. Uh, some were obese. Some had other comorbidities or other health problems. Uh, he found that uh, about four years later, 82% uh, of them still were feeling well, functioning well, did not need knee replacement, uh, and were happy with the results they got. And they were all doing image-guided visco supplementation like we're talking about here. Now, of course, 82% uh, is not 100%, Brad. And so when you ask about results, we're talking about four out of five patients getting a satisfactory to excellent result. So I, I think those results stand for themselves. I, I might add on there that at a huge and dramatic savings to the system, uh, a study that was done uh, representing a group of 100,000 patients, and it was estimated that by doing visco supplementation rather than adding in surgery or replacement, that that's the system alone, the insurance world, could save well over $9 million on surgeries and hospitalizations. So that's just an interesting add-on to that, to that research issue. Yeah. You mentioned the um, um, guided injections a lot. Um, right. What... What could you talk about that more? Meaning, um, like I said, you know, I've seen research stating that that if if injections are not guided, that that they can miss the joint space. I believe it was thirty percent of the time. Um, have you ever had any patients come to you that have had the visco supplementation and it didn't work for them, and you and you used the guided I imaging to do the injection? 
and and then have it work? Um, yeah, that that's quite that's an excellent question. So yes, that you're you're uh, you're looking at that research is correct. About one out of three procedures injected into well, and, and what's interesting about this research is they actually did the studies with normal knees and the spaces are much wider. But even with normal knees, uh, experienced docs seem to miss that joint space up to one third of the time, about 30 percent. That is the correct number. And when you have a narrow joint space, I'm going to imagine, and there is no such study, that missing the joint space would get more dramatic, maybe half the patients, because it's, again, as we talked about in our opening discussion, an arthritic joint is narrowed. It's more and more difficult to access it to put medicines in there. So um, that that's quite an issue, and that's the reason why everybody gets treated with the special imaging to make sure it's accurate and precise. Um, but to answer your question, we have we get hundreds of inquiries uh, a week about our arthritis and other pain treatment programs. And many do call stating they didn't get good results, but they'd like to find out if the imaging would help. Uh, from my experience in hearing what the docs have to say about it, many of those patients that failed before uh, have started to respond better. You know, put it this way, if you, you can't guarantee an exact result, but if you can't guarantee that the medicine that you're treating with gets exactly where it needs, I can guarantee you your outcome will not be as good. What we can guarantee is that each and every procedure gets exactly where it needs to be each time, giving you the potential to have the best overall response. Awesome, awesome stuff. Um, and you guys do uh, a screening there to see who's, who's the best for this treat treatment? Could you t tell us about that? Right. So... Our position, we started a program uh, as this started to get more and more popular, <clears throat> where actually a patient's call, we, we don't know if we can help them to start. And so um, what we put together is a special program, and it is basically a no-cost, risk-free, obligation-free screening appointment. Uh, in that appointment, Brad, a patients will sit down, usually with a screening doc. Lots of questions will be asked about function, your general health, any uh, issues where, which would knock you out of the box as a candidate, um, your general health history, what other treatments you've tried, whether it be other forms of visco supplementation done blind, or cortisone, or taking medicines, or physical therapy. And we should probably talk about those other treatments at some point in time. Um, but the patient comes in, we do a detailed history. Uh, their knee will, or hip or shoulder will be evaluated, range of motion studies. Uh, maybe watching a patient walk and move, whatever the doctor feels is necessary to examine. And if necessary, we even have x-ray facilities where we can take an x-ray, which will confirm uh, the presence of the arthritis. And once we do that, we can let the patient know what's going on. At that point, patients are, are encouraged to ask all the questions they want about their individual case. And of course, if the docs feel they can't help, I mean, if you've let your say your knee go too far, and it's so bad that none of our treatments can possibly help. You know, we'll refer you for the proper services, proper medical uh, services. Um, but if the docs feel they can help, they'll make their recommendation treat recommended treatment plan. Uh, they'll take it step by step. And of course, it's up to the patient at that point. There's no obligation to decide how they'd like to proceed. They can go home and think about it. Many patients are so enthusiastic. They want to start on the spot. So, um, that's how we handle the the, uh, the screening program. Awesome, awesome. We're going to move on to the next treatment here. Is there anything you'd like to say on this treatment before we move on? I think the, the just to wrap up is that, you know, it's gotten very popular, uh, probably because it's so common with knees, but we also have had pretty good success uh, with treating arthritic shoulders, arthritic hips, arthritic ankles. Now, keep in mind that every case of a shoulder pain is not arthritis. And there's other treatments that may that we can offer, um, or a hip, uh, that may work very nicely. Uh, and again, this is the world of non-surgical interventional orthopedics. And um, so I, I think you have to understand that arthritis of other joints can be handled uh, by these this visco supplementation process. And and it's quite similar to what we talked about in general here. Here's so a question um, that I get a lot. Um, insurance co cover this stuff? So many insurances do cover visco supplementation. 
And now here's how we handle insurance, Matt. Uh, since the doctor has to determine, so, so stay, taking a step back, insurance has gotten so complex that every little thing a doctor does for you in applying treatment or an exam or an x-ray, they all have complex codes. Uh, these are called CPT procedure codes and diagnosis codes. So what we have to do is we take a patient through screening. If the doctor accepts the case, he'll give us the exact recommended treatments. And we have a fabulous insurance staff. All you have to do at the presentation of the screening is bring in an ID and insurance card. Our insurance staff will find out exactly what your coverage is. Uh, they'll give the insurance company the codes and we can find out exactly what's covered. The good news is that the vast majority of major medical carriers, uh, some union plans, work comp, personal injury, if you've injured yourself in some sort of accident, and as well as traditional Medicare and some of the non-traditional Medicare is like United Healthcare. They do cover many of these procedures quite nicely. But again, it's a case-by-case -case basis, and we check that out for everybody once the doctor determines what to do uh, precisely for them. Awesome. Awesome. All right, we're going we're gonna to move on to, to the next thing here. And um, this is a big buzzword now. I've seen it a lot. There's a lot of athletes that, that have flown over Germany, I believe, and, and big, big names to get these kind of treatments. And um, they're here now, and you guys are do, do, doing this stuff. It's called PRP. What's PRP? What does it stand for? What is it? What do you guys treat? Um, and, right. you know, are you, having, are, you, are you having success with that too? Same, same, same kind of stuff. Right. So PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma. And so platelet-rich plasma is really, um, uh, this is part of the world of regenerative medicine. Uh, it's done in a process called autologous, I'll use a fancy term here, autologous tissue transfer. What that means, Brad, is that we are uh, taking tissue from one part of your body and inserting it, replacing it in another part to assist you in healing. But platelet-rich plasma specifically is a process where uh, we will take, about 30 to 60 cc's of your own blood. It's then placed in a special preparation kit and it's put through a rather intricate spin down process in something called the medical centrifuge. This is a machine that spins real fast. What will ultimately happen after about a 30 or 40 minute process is we'll get a concentration of just your own body's platelets. The, they call this the Buffy coat. Uh, this is then drawn into a, a tube and now it's ready to apply to the area that's damaged. Um, so the idea of platelets, keep in mind, like if you cut yourself, uh, Brad, uh, what heals that tissue is, um, is your platelets. You know how if you'll cut yourself on, say, your arm, you'll develop a scar. That comes because naturally your body sees the injury and platelets go there to create scar tissue and healing. But going back to the PRP, when we take this concentrated uh, part, of the PRP, it's just super concentrated with just platelets. And we have a method called the m -site method where we really purify it so the platelets, there's nothing else in there. There's very few red blood cells that can be inflammatory. It's pure platelets and a little bit of liquid. Now the platelet which plasma has been very successful in athletes and it started uh, being popular for like tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, things like that. But it's been very successful for tendon injuries. Um, sprains, strains, those type of things. But what PRP has in it is growth factors and it stimulates growth factors within uh, the tissue and it can help arthritis as well. And sometimes it's used alongside of the visco supplementation we talked about. Um, and there's different forms and there's different ways to do it. But I think for the sake of the listener, PRP is very good. We have a lot of athletes coming in for, this is not only for, you know, uh, baby boomers and seniors, but this is also for the younger guys that have those chronic strains that just won't heal. And, and it can work very nicely. And the doctors are really good at explaining it because it gets a little technical. But it's, it's been very, very, very um, uh, encouraging the results that we've been getting to date. Brad, you there? Yep. I, I lost okay. it for one second there. But okay. We're back. Okay, good. Um, yeah. So, so brief, briefly, what, what are the conditions you're using this? You mentioned mu muscle sprains and strains. And this, that. Let's just give a brief overview of 
what the conditions you're you're treating with this. Um, and once again, you guys do um, a screening a screening for this too. Right. Well, of course, everything starts with the screening. Uh, patients call and say, they say, hey, well, what do you do for this and that? And of course, the answer is, well, that's best determined in the screening by one of our, you know, trained and really excellent, knowledgeable docs. But the PRP has been used for good old-fashioned arthritis. If someone chooses that, or they haven't been responsive to the visco supplementation, uh, tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, Achilles strains, knee sprains, shoulder sprains, chronic tendonitis. A lot of shoulder pain is not arthritic, but it's from tendonitis. And injecting into those tendons can be very, very fruitful and has some very good results. And a lot of sports injuries and those type of things that have been non-responsive to routine care uh, is promotes healing. It makes healing go much faster. And we have some really nice packets of information. And I think you're going to put a number up soon where patients can call and ask for kits about platelet-rich plasma and some of the other procedures and treatments we have uh, that are available. Yeah, what's what, what's really great about you, you guys is that some doctors, you know, they, they, they do one thing. They'll do the visco or they'll do the PRP or they do the stem cell. You guys are doing a lot of stuff there, and you, and you guys do it all under one roof. So when a patient come, they come in, um, <laughs> they're examined, and you guys determine the exact – procedure or series of procedures that that are good for them um and we're going to talk more about that a minute too so let's get to the next thing everybody wants to get to this one i'm sure here stem cell therapy um once again this is this is huge um you hear this a lot um could you tell us separate here the fact from the fiction, um, what stem cell th therapy is, what, what a stem cell is, um, the different kinds of stem cells, where, where, where they can come from, and, and what kind of uh, treatments are, do you guys do, do there? Right. Uh, well, stem cell is a fascinating discussion, and you're right, there is a lot of uh, hype out there. There's a lot of fiction. Uh, but there's a lot of truth. There's a really probably the most exciting part of musculoskeletal medicine, and they are using stem cells to treat many neurological conditions. We'll kind of stick to the musculoskeletal for right now. But um, stem cells are cells that are found in every tissue in your body on the blood vessels. Um, they're technically in little cells called parasites that kind of sit on your blood vessels. And again, our doctors are much better at explaining the real technicals of this. But stem cells are found in every tissue in your body. Uh, what we found, Brad, and, and what is well known, is that the richest uh, and easiest way to collect stem cells from your own body uh, is in your body fat. Now, bone marrow is also popular. Uh, the reason we don't use bone marrow is because it's almost a quasi-surgical procedure to collect your stem cells. You have to create a biopsy punch into your hip bone and it's, uh, it can be very painful. Often it really requires light anesthesia. And then you have to collect bone marrow. And, and the yield is, um, well, it's a little bit feeble. Uh, you've heard of people going overseas to have stem cell. And the reason they do it is because overseas, the FDA won't allow us to do it here. They take bone marrow stem cells and they culture them. And the only reason they culture them is so they get enough stem cells to make sure that they get the effect. What we, our doctors, like better is using your own body fat. By the way, this is all part of that fancy term, autologous tissue transfer. We take tissue from your own body, we prepare it in a way that it can assist you in healing or promote regeneration, uh, and then we reintroduce it into that area. So with the body fat, literally the way we collect it is with a mini liposuction procedure. So some patients tease it, they're, they're gonna get a little liposculptor and look a little thinner after. Uh, which I guess is an advantage, but we take a small amount of fat from your, your tummy, uh, it's collected, and then we have a special preparation, and this preparation procedure is called lipogens. Now, the use of the word stem cells gets controversial, and the FDA has issues here and there, but essentially, when you take your body fat, uh, it goes into two very large test tubes or canisters, and the lipogems procedure is then started. Now, I will say this as an aside, Brad, 
many clinics simply take that fat and spin it down and, and they claim that they're separating fat from stem cells. I've looked at a lot of this stuff and I've talked to the docs about it, but the truth is you do have a compote of stem cells when you spin it down, but they're still caught in a matrix like a, a fibrous like web. And essentially, even if you took that liquid with the stem cells, they, it doesn't work mm -hmm. because the stem cells can't emerge and do what they're supposed to do. So here's how our doctors uh, have been working through that and have figured out uh, this system. Actually, the system was developed by an Italian surgeon named Carlos Tremolota, who actually trained our docs on the procedure in our New York facility. Um, so what Dr. Tremolota came up with is a mechanical way to properly separate collect fat and separate purely or as pure as possible the stem cells from all the rest of the gunk that comes in fat. This is called the lipogems technique. Essentially the canisters are put into a special system. They are mechanically broken down gently, separating the stem cells from the rest of the liquid and gunk and blood in the fat. It's called a micro washing technique. Then after you get one compote of that, it's rewashed and wash several times. It takes all of about two hours plus just to prep the stem cells. Now what we do is we do a one day procedure where the patient is actually, the stem cells are actually applied to the air being treated on that same day. By the way, Brad, everything again is done under guided imaging. You have to make sure the stem cells get as close to the tissue uh, that you're treating as possible. And that's the best way for it to be done. Now the exciting thing about stem cells and sometimes it's, com it's uh, combined in a system with PRP on separate days, um, the stem cells, uh, we believe, uh, probably can incite regrowth and regeneration of tissue. There's been indications of some regrowth of cartilage on pre and post MRIs, uh, regeneration of various tendons that are partially torn. By the way, a completely torn tendon is usually a surgical procedure. Not everything can be helped by this. It is not a magic wand. It's not a miracle cure. You can't cure everything from head to toe. But we have found it very successful in those difficult cases that have been non-responsive or someone just wants to go all out to get that knee or hip or back or shoulder completely healed as best as possible. So the, the, so far the, the, uh, the results have been rewarding. Um, we feel more patients should embrace this and it's starting to catch on in popularity. Yeah, it, it's really, really cool stuff, you know, and, and it seems to be um, the future me medicine here is going to be the stem cells. Um, is, is there any si side effects here? You know, the beauty of uh, any of this regenerative work, whether it be PRP or stem cells, is you're using your own tissue, Brad. You're not using somebody else's tissue. You know, one of the things where uh, surgeons do transplants of organs and tissues is the rejection of that tissue because it has antigens on it or things that make your body reject it. But when you're reinserting your own cells, there's no little to no chance of it being rejected. Of course, you have to apply it properly in the right uh, format and the right procedure and under guided imaging, etc. But there's, there, there's very, we haven't had anybody had a major, nobody rejects the stem cells or the PRP in any way, shape or form. Uh, and by the way, when you asked about, you know, fact is fact and fiction, there's a lot of um, promoting of this, you know, um, amniotic tissue and these type of things, uh, infant, infant cells and embryonic cells. Uh, the problem with this, it, it, it may work. It, the problem is it doesn't really have stem cells in it. And another problem is it comes from somebody else's tissue. So while it may give you some relief via some growth factors, the truth is it's not autologous tissue transfer. You're taking tissue from someone else and you're putting it into your body. So, you know, our docs, I've heard them talk about it. They feel there could be some risk in, in doing that. And sometimes they'll claim it's these tissues, these amniotic type things are, you know, third party uh, tested. But, you know, I don't know who that third party is. Our docs don't know. Our clinic doesn't know. And so we just don't embrace it at this point. Perhaps we'll change our mind if something comes around about it. But, but so, so it does make, to answer your question, we haven't had any problems with any of the procedures. We haven't had anybody reject them. No infections. Uh, no, nothing, nothing on the negative side. Of course, again, Brad, 
uh, everybody responds in different ways. One of the things to add about the stem cells, remember we're trying to get tissue to regenerate. So in order, if you wanted to say get a ligament or a joint to heal, remember it takes many, many cycles of cell rejuvenation to really have that tissue change. So you may not feel the best result from it for six months out. What we are finding that once you start to respond, this is not something you have to do over and over and over again. Occasionally we'll have someone that wants to have a second procedure, but it's normally not recommended or talked of, of having follow-ups or anything along that line, which makes it really, really exciting. Yeah, it is. And, and what, what conditions are, are you, are you guys treating with this? Um, and, and, and what kind of results should the a average person expect? So I think what we're sort of reserving a regenerative programs and, and, and I should stop here. Sometimes we combine them in a severe case with the PRP. The way we look at the PRP is the way we'll do that. Uh, we'll, we'll, the doctor will do a PRP treatment first with the platelets. This will stimulate growth factors. Sometimes they joke as it's like a fertilizer. In other words, it gets the tissue moving. It's like an espresso shot for the, the area. Let's say it's a knee or a hip. A couple weeks later, they'll come in and do the procedure with the fat-based stem cells, and that's the seeding. So first we're fertilizing, then we're seeding to stimulate or fire off growth or regrowth or regeneration. And then uh, they may follow up with another platelet treatment, you know, more fertilizer um, to enhance the growth factors and enhance the... Uh, the stem cells. That's in the more severe cases. And well, normally if patients are non-responsive to visco or other general procedures, this is something that's talked about. So again, uh, severe hip or joint arthritis, a tendon problems, minor or partial tears, general joint pain. We're starting to consider using it for facet syndrome, which is where the joints of the back are very bad and there's chronic back pain that's been non-responsive. So most or many musculoskeletal conditions can be approached. We don't get involved with treating multiple sclerosis or blindness and, you know, all those things that are kind of talked about. Um, and I think stem cells will have a place in, in neurological conditions. We just don't do that in our clinic. Yeah, br briefly here, you know, you, you just touched, you touched on a subject there. And, and I saw 60 mi Minutes did a, did a piece on this and they were exposing some doctors doing stem cell and, and there was a lot of claims and, and, and they were saying that it was ba basically fraud, you know, um, you know, I know that, you know, you probably don't know those, do those doctors and this and that, but what's your take on a lot of these claims versus, versus reality here versus what you guys do? Yeah. You know, that is, that is a problem. Um, sometimes things will catch on. And, you know, clinics that don't have the best, the best intentions uh, for patients will, will overhype procedures. Um, mm -hmm. But again, this is not a magic wand. Um, and I think some of those clinics may not even have been well trained. And they're overzealous. They're over aggressive. They're treating things that they shouldn't. And that's why we're, we're very conservative. We, we don't press that lever for stem cells unless someone is very severe and non-responsive to everything else or can't tolerate anything else. Um, and so, you know, I would have to agree with you that this can create a black eye for what could be a very, very good procedure. But keep in mind, this can happen in any area of the medical world. People that are doing too much surgery or look at the opioid epidemic where possibly well-meaning doctor prescribing painkillers to make people feel better. And, and they become addicted and it's become a huge problem. So overutilization of everything can create a black eye. Something that was well intended becomes an issue. So um, I, I, I think that probably the medical boards need to create some oversight and research on this and uh, make sure that the docs that are using it are using it properly. Yeah, I, I think a big thing is is anytime you you see some something that sounds too good to be true, it you you usually is, and that doesn't mean that stem cells and these things they you know they don't have an incredible future here. Like a laser eye, you know, when people go get their eyes done done now, if you said this fifty years ago, that's way too good 
to be to be true. You wouldn't you would never believe that, you know. And you know oh. now today you can go in and you can get your eyes done and and get your sight back, you know. Um, incredible. So, but when you see a lot a lot of stuff where there's a lot of claims and there's a lot of stuff, that's why I really wanted to have you you on this talk today because um, I know I know you guys are honest there and and you don't hype stuff up and you and you in and you tell the people that come in, look, here's the honest truth here. Some people get helped. Some people don't get helped, right. you know, right. um, and medicine, that's really what it is. Um, anything else you would like to say about this here, about the stem, about the stem cells? You guys also do, once again, a screening for this, too. Just, just one last thing on the stem cells is we did mention it. We certainly don't quote it as a magic wand, but I think patients also have to have reasonable uh, expectations to their outcomes. You know, if you're, um, you know, 65 years old and you're, say your knee's been bothering you for 20 years, you're grade four bone on bone, and we apply any one of these proper treatments, you know, feeling like you're 25 may not be reasonable. Uh, feeling like you're gonna be the starting guard for the New York Knicks uh, might not be reasonable, but feeling better walking more normally, getting up and down stairs, not having agony all day. I mean, these are possibilities, but I think you just have to be reasonable with your outcomes. I mean, even if you got stem cells and had a great reaction, um, you know, to go from crippled to running the, a marathon may not be reasonable, but somewhere in between certainly, certainly is doable for many patients. Cool. Cool. We're going to, uh, move ahead here and, uh, we're going to talk about one last one, genicular nerve block. Most people probably ha haven't heard of, of this treatment yet. Um, but you guys, you guys have had some great success with, with this. What, what is this treatment? What's it used? What's it used for? So genicular nerve block, this is really good for a very small subsection of patients, knee, knee pain sufferers. Uh, the genicular nerves are the nerves that surround your knee. Uh, Brad, there's two types of nerves in the body. One is motor, that makes your muscles contract, makes you move and walk and push and pull, uh, and one are sensory. So these sensory nerves are the ones that carry pain signals. They also carry a sensitivity to uh, heat, to cold, to touch, to pressure, etc. cetera. So um, many patients, when we've exhausted all our possibilities, um, the genicular nerve block may be an appropriate discussion. But another sect of patients that have really been embracing the genicular nerve block are those that have had knee replacements um, that have not worked out well. So while many knee replacements can work, uh, some patients, no matter how good the surgeon was, just they just have problems. That replacement is painful and they're not happy with it and they may or they may have post-surgical scarring. Uh, and this is where possibly a genicular nerve block comes in. Of course, Brad, these are always our doctor's decision. This is just for general discussion, as is all the things we've been talking about today. Uh, these all have to be medical recommendations. Not anything that we talked about today should be geared as a recommendation. But getting back to the genicular nerve block. So uh, you've probably all heard about people getting a, a nerve blocks and epidurals and things like that for their backs, uh, which, by the way, we do offer in our clinics. Uh, but these are basically a way to block pain. And so if you're a candidate for genicular nerve block uh, or possible candidate, this is done in up to two or up to three steps. So what has to happen is we're not treating the joint directly. We're treating the nerves at this point. The doctor will, again, under fluoroscopic imaging, uh, painlessly inject around the nerve with a special pain blocking medicine. This is called a diagnostic block. The diagnostic block should get anywhere between 50 and 80% short-term relief. So we'll actually have a patient stay in the office 30 to 60 minutes and see if they respond. If you start to feel better within a short period of time, the doctors will have you back a few weeks later. Sometimes they have to do a second diagnostic block just to double check, or they may go to the final step, which is what's called genicular nerve ablation or radio frequency treatment. What they'll do is they'll take special probes guided under imaging again, and they'll apply these probes to the nerve, which actually uh, sort of like heat up the nerve and create a complete blockage of that nerve flow. 
by blocking the nerve flow, you're going to reduce that pain dramatically. And, and some of the research, I believe there was a study in an Indian medical journal that found that some patients, the relief can last up to four years, some patients less. The nice thing about it is if the pain returns, you can just do it again. Uh, and this has been very fruitful, again, for knee pain sufferers and those of it exhausted all the other possibilities, uh, but also another thing that can be discussed with one of our docs at a screening appointment. Awesome. Yeah, so, so that's a treatment that, that you've had a lot of success with, but, but it's not the first treatment. It's something that, you know, you, 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 know, you guys are going to look at them, um, possibly try the other treatments out first, and, 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 and this was more of a, 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 last, a last resort, correct? Uh, yeah, I would say that's pretty well stated. So if patients have not responded to, say, lubricants, if they're arthritic, or if they have a tendon problem and they haven't responded to the regenerative type stuff, then this is, um, uh, for knees, this is a possibility. By the way, uh, it's called, it's, it's a different type of block. The name is different, but it can be done on the hip. Uh, and the shoulder as well. Uh, it's very infrequent that we use it for those areas, but it can be done in those areas as well. And the same, the same type of procedure, generally speaking. Okay, so because we're kind of break, breaking up here, the internet c connection here. This is done on you guys are, are do, doing this on the on the knee, the hip, and the shoulder. The shoulder, correct? It can be done on those areas if need be. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and that procedure might not be called a genicular nerve block. It, it just might be a different name, right. but a shoulder but the nerve procedure block, a hip is nerve similar. Block. But the procedure is similar applied to that yes. area. Correct. Right. Cool. Cool. All right. Um, that's it for today. Really good. Um, we're going to, we're going to talk, talk about um, uh, one more time here. You guys, what you guys offer anyone who's listening, who's listening to, to this, um, what, what they can get if they want more information, if they want um, to come in and talk to a, a doctor, what's their next step? So um, one, one thing we should mention, we do have two facilities in New York City and Manhattan. One is in Midtown. It's on the corner of 57th and 6th. And one is downtown. Uh, Oh, about four blocks south of the, the old World Trade Center area. Um, so all they have to do is call the number on the screen. When they call that number, um, they just have to ask the, sometimes I'll pick up or ask the other scheduling coordinators about a screening, tell them what their problem is. They'll get a little bit of information, try to route them to the office that's closest or most appropriate for them. And uh, they'll set up that appointment time and you'll, you'll go in at, at no cost and find out if there's any help for you. If you just have some questions or you want a packet of information on say hip treatments or PRP or stem cell or the visco supplementation, you know, you can get that too and we'll mail you another packet uh, and you can always put some thought into it. But, but so those offices are available. They just have to call up, they'll set up the screening and, and they'll go from there. Awesome, awesome stuff. Anything else you would like to say in, clo in closing here? It was, it was a great talk. Yeah, I think that um, patients that, that are, have been all over the place and have considered or been told, I, I can't tell you, Brad, how many patients have said everywhere they go, the doctor just says, I need surgery, or they're putting them on medications. Most of the patients that come to us have tried physical therapy. They've tried acupuncture. They've tried home exercise. They've been taking, you know, gobs of Advil's or Aleve's or Tylenol, even prescribed pain medication, and they're really not responding. Or they've actually gone to physical therapy and it aggravates, or they've taken so many pills they have gastritis, or you know, you can deliver, get, get liver problems and kidney problems. You, you can't take medications forever. So if, this is, if you're fitting into this category, uh, then it might be wise to consider getting a screening. Uh, the only thing the screening costs you is some time. It takes about 60 to 90 minutes to get a screening. Again, it's really stress-free. The screeners are great. The docs are great. They'll evaluate you. There's no obligation. You'd be very comfortable there. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll hope this is helpful to those that have been sitting on the fence and thinking about doing this. But, but if you're ready, give us a call and get your information, and, and we'll hope to see you in the facility. 
What about this too? I know you guys because I I've actually spoken to you and and thinking about getting some some of this stuff done myself because of all the sports I played over the years and stuff. Um, and and you guys are busy. Um, if you, you you know you guys are getting a ton ton of calls call, calls and stuff. Um, if somebody wants to get in to see to see you guys, what's your best advice when they when they give you guys a call and when should they call and stuff? Right. So, I, you know, I think the best thing is to call. There are people handling the phones between nine and six, Monday through Thursday. Uh, if we get a lot of call volume at times, sometimes 100, 120, 130 calls in a day. Um, if we are backed up and we can't grab the phone right away, there's an opportunity to leave a message. Don't hang up. Leave your name. Spell any uncommon names. Leave your phone number and leave the best general time for us to get back to you. Someone will get back to you within 24 hours. We'll get you the information you need. If you need to, we'll set you up for a screening. Uh, if you need a referral somewhere else, if we know someone, we'll try to help you with that. Uh, but that's what you do. Call the office or call the facility at the number that's on your screen. Ask the scheduler to set you up for the screening. Or if you want, you know, send you the packet of information and we'll just take it from there. That's the best way to go about that, Brad. Yeah, you were kind of break, breaking up there. The uh, the best time to call would be between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m., correct? Correct. Eastern time. Correct. Eastern time. All right, cool, cool. Yeah, by the this way, was we, great, um, great. we get patients from the, other, from the other time zone, so if you're calling from, you know, uh, the Midwest and you're an hour behind, just, just keep that in mind that we have that time zone difference. Yeah, you guys have really, you know, you guys have blazed a blazed a trail here, and there's there's people come in from different states to see you guys, and um, it's really incredible work. So, um, so that's it for today. It was some great stuff here. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna have you back back on. Of course, we're gonna do a, a whole bunch of these um, next time. I think we're gonna talk about just talk about back back pain and. Yeah. Because you guys are doing some great stuff there, too, for back pain. Uh, anything else you would like to say? Yeah, I think that wraps it up for today. I think let everybody absorb all this information. And, you know, if you've been sitting on the fence, like I say, just, just give us a call. It's not really a big deal to come in. We've got both our offices are very nice. The staff is great. They're all friendly. And I think you'll find it fruitful. Hey, you know. Even if you just want to get a second opinion, come on in. If someone told you you need surgery or you need stem cell or you just want to get a second opinion, no worries. Just come in, sit down with the doc. They'll be happy to talk to you and see if they can help. Cool. Thank, thanks a lot for com, com, coming on today. And, uh, you know, we're probably going to do another one of these in about a week. So if people, if people want to, want to uh, subscribe, hit the subscribe button and, uh, uh, hit the notifications button too, so when we put the next one up, you're notified and and you don't miss it. And like I said, we're probably going to do that one on back pain. And then I spoke with you too. We're going to do one um, um, headaches. Um, and there's a whole bunch yeah. of stuff you guys are treating there. So um, on the YouTube, subscribe um, and notifications and stuff. And uh, we're going to get back to you guys to you guys soon. So. Uh, thanks a lot. Alex was here, NYC Pain MD, incredible work. And uh, we'll, we'll see you guys in about a week. Okay, Brad, thanks.